Okay, so, oh, this guy right here is not here. Mike is going to be my um, my James Copic today. <laughs> Your fallback. <laughs> a little shorter, a little balder. Hey. <laughs> so you are? Oh, yeah, and I'm Cheryl Maris. Most of everybody in here knows me, but I am the operations for Boeing, and Mike is our Altoros yep. helper. I so. came in as part of a pivotal project to help uh, uh, provision PCF and operationalize it. So standing in for James. Go ahead. Okay, so if you come to Boeing and you want to be a part of our team, you get to pair in these awesome pairing stations. Best pairing no. station in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this is, uh, we had to work really closely with our security team. And EJ was always telling us, ah, you can't use Ubuntu. E and what e about EJ Windows? was a security focal. Sorry. Yeah, yep. EJ, security. And um, so he was asking about all the controls and multi-factor and how are you going to get all this done. And we ended up pairing like this a lot with DJ <laughs> to get our <laughs> securities right. in line. Obviously, with Boeing being a government supplier and being in commercial uh, you know, aerospace and, and satellites and so on, security and compliance is a huge concern, obviously. So we spent quite a bit of yeah. time working hand in hand with security, which is huge when you're uh, provisioning the product and trying to get the platform uh, in, into the enterprise, right? To, to work closely with enterprise and, or uh, security and compliance, it's key. Yes. So he obviously he had some concerns. Uh, Ubuntu was not a standard uh, within Boeing, uh, right? CentOS yeah, and, and other, and Unixes, right? Uh, right, security controls, oh, obviously yeah. they have some, can we go back a slide? Boeing has some standardized security controls on uh, Unix systems. They, they minimize and harden them, and then they have their own uh, security controls that they like to put on top of that, right? Uh, Multi-factor authentication, of course, is key within, within Boeing. They're trying to go passwordless, or they are, they are passwordless uh, in many places, right? And uh, direct access, of course, goes along with the whole security uh, concern. Even though the hosts are exposed, for a number of reasons on the internet, the, you still cannot access them directly. And so we'll talk about how we kind of addressed some of these uh, concerns. Okay. Thank you, Mike. All right. And this is how we did it. We did um, added some add-ons to our runtime config, and for each security finding, we added right. a section to the runtime. Right. Config. And so what we see uh, these. Boeing's concerns are not uncommon. We see this throughout the industry, right? And a lot of customers will tr naturally tr go down the, hey, how do I patch the OS? How do I harden it, minimize it, just like I, I would with all my other uh, deployed systems? So you're, the natural tendency is to try to create your own stem cell or your own OS image, which is um, highly uh, advised against. It's, it's a, ba a bad practice. The, the way to do that is to create what are called Bosch add-ons which are Bosch releases, which can go on all VMs or selectively uh, go on subsets of VMs. For example, we can say that Windows specific code only goes onto Windows uh, virtual machines, for example. So we, we addressed a lot of these uh, security concerns by creating a number of, of Bosch add-ons uh, to address Boeing's unique uh, security requirements such as, uh, obviously most places have uh, legal text that they want to put on hosts. When you, if you were to access a, a host via like an SSH session, present a legal banner, you know, all activities monitored, subject to whatever. Uh, you know, D6, DCIX is a Boeing specific set of security controls that we ported from existing Unix systems over to, uh, to Linux systems. Uh, and likewise, there's a Windows-based uh, version of that as well. Uh, we did a custom add-on there uh, for Boeing, um, radically different than the Linux version. Uh, antivirus, uh, it's a common thing on Windows, not so common on Linux. The support solution, uh, typically out of Pivotal and others, is to use ClamAV, uh, which is real popular in the ecosystem. However, ClamAV, suffers from the lack of a centralized console, 
uh, so centralized management and reporting is what it lacks. So we, we uh, created a custom uh, Bosch release for uh, McAfee antivirus or vCell, virus scan enterprise Linux, I believe, uh, which was a posed lot its of own work. challenges for sure. <laughs> and then this one is actually, this one's my favorite, IP tables release here. This is, um, it's not, uh, I don't believe we open sourced it. We should consider it, though. No. This, uh, this uh, allows us to uh, address the unique concerns of, of access at the network level. So the host being exposed, I may be getting ahead of myself, the host being exposed on the network uh, presented a problem. They're not in, on an unrouted network here, like is best practice. But instead, we, we put host-based firewalls on all the systems to say, don't allow any connections from anywhere outside of yourself. So the, the PCF network blocks, all the hosts within there can, can talk to each other, but other than that, nothing can talk to it, except for the load balancers. So obviously you want traffic to come in from the load balancers to your Go routers, to the routing tier. We allowed that, obviously. And then we allowed traffic from the management hosts, the jump boxes, yeah. effectively creating uh, you know, an, iso an isolated network without the isolated network. And we had to do that because we didn't have uh, NSX or any uh, software-based, uh, software-defined network there at the time. And we're still using it today. Go for it. And then as far as Windows, we worked very closely with our uh, security team. We paired with them to, we had to get the McAfee client uh, working in our new environment, right? And that's right. where... Also, Mike helped out. Do you want to explain how you did that? Yeah, unfortunately, on a vSphere environment, right, you have to create your own stem cells, which kind of goes against what I was saying about creating your own, uh, you know, uh, Windows image or your own OS image. But it's, it just is what it is on vSphere. If you were to go out on AWS or Azure or anywhere else, you get those, uh, those stem cells for free. You don't have to go through the, the, the task of creating them yourself. Uh, but fortunately, what, what did work out nicely is that Windows, or the Boeing stem cell that we used, already had McAfee baked in. Right. But it did not um, play nicely with Cloud Foundry. Uh, in particular, scanning the, the staging area, or the, the droplet area, the droplet cache on the uh, Windows uh, stem cells proved prob problematic. So there was a bit, quite a bit of uh, back and forth there, uh, just debugging and working actually closely with McAfee to, to mm -hmm. figure out the problems. Were you on the phone with them a lot? Yeah. <laughs> so in the end, we ended up just having to exclude a bunch of folders, var vcap, this and that, and whatever, to actually get it to work. Which you could argue probably reduces the, the effectiveness, obviously, of <laughs> the antivirus. And may cause some issues. Yeah. That's another story. <laughs> yeah. So that was the Windows side. On the Linux side, however, uh, we, we created a Bosch release to pull down the, the McAfee antivirus bits and do an install. I remember we weren't allowed to use Ubuntu, and we had to get that pulled into Boeing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Kind of jumping we ahead. Yes, yeah, so we had to work closely with security and compliance to get Ubuntu pushed through. And as a matter of fact, the, a lot of the concerns that were there around the hardening of the OS and minimizing it were not only addressed by the stem cell creation process from the community it actually went above and beyond. And, and this is what we see at a lot of customers, actually, is that they say, they look at the stem cell hardening repo and the documentation and they say, wow, this is even more than what we thought. Like, we're going to start incorporating some of this community goodness into our own custom builds, which is uh, pretty great. Yeah. And then in terms of the, uh, Cheryl, don't let me take all your... Steal all your thunder. Don't let me steal all your thunder here. Oh, but, well, I'm reading, so okay. go ahead. <laughs> I, I would say, though, on the, on the Linux side, the, the McAfee antivirus um, is challenging, uh, to say the least. Um, we, we found that uh, you can do the install and you can pull down the initial uh, definitions from an enterprise policy server, an EPO server, but you cannot reboot the VM. Yeah. So... Uh, if there are any issues, and you, you know, if you do like a Bosch SSH, you get in there and you think, oh, I'll just reboot the VM, no harm, no foul, right? It's clustered or, or you know, uh, HA. It, we found that it just doesn't come back. Uh, McAfee, for, for whatever reason, the version of McAfee that's used there, McAfee antivirus, 
completely hangs the VM. So it was a hard lesson learned, actually. Um, I thought it was like, still in the port. No. I'm sorry? I thought it was still in the port before SQL. Oh, there's there. that as well, yeah. Well, so to, to finish out this thing, though, uh, <laughs> we end up having to just say recreate. Bosch, recreate the VM. Just if you're having problems and there's something crazy wrong with it, just, uh, it, you know, it's a reproducible uh, environment. This is when we through. did the repave. Created the repave. For yeah. So and there. actually, yeah, we do repaves uh, every every week there, uh, which security loves. Uh, anyway, everybody loves it. And the cool thing about repaves that often is you effectively test tested your ability to recreate the environment for whatever reason, a disaster or whatever. You can say, so he says, well, what's your level of confidence that you can recreate the environment? Well, we did it at least 52 times last year. I'm pretty sure <laughs> we can do it again, right? It works nicely. And then to Cheryl's point, another issue that we ran into with uh, McAfee, unfortunately, and this is actually, I've heard of this uh, with another product as well, is stealing ports. Mm -hmm. So when um, McAfee would come up, it spins up its own web server, and it would steal port 80, I wouldn't say 8080 or something like that, which was also hard-coded in one of the uh, Bosch releases for another product. I think it was a MySQL yeah, something or another. So we ended up having to, and it turns out the McAfee port was not used within Boeing. So what we did was we, in the installer, we put in a timeout. A, we put in a, a delay, delay, a timer in there for like 10 minutes or something like that nah, to give the other long. processes on the box time to come up and claim that port. So then when McAfee tried to go claim it, it was a port in use and it, it failed. Yeah. Uh, it, was a, it was a hack, but it worked. <laughs> We learned from that one on the Nexus upgrade, too. <laughs> yeah. So several challenges around McAfee antivirus. Yeah. But it is what it is. If it's required, you know, in the enterprise, then so be it, right? Uh, Sorry, we're reading through because um, my other half was really the one that was doing all these. Yeah, he and couldn't he, be he's here. He's kind of very great. Yeah. But uh, so, what do we added? Security controls, compliance, client. Go ahead yeah, and speak so this up your time, Brad. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. I was saying Brad could speak up too. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the custom security controls on Windows, uh, because PCF is a or Cloud Foundry, sorry, or Bosch created VMs. It's a it's a dynamic, very dynamic environment. Uh, it kind of changes things in terms of a lot, a lot of companies want to spin up a VM, have it register with a system, like a system of record. Here's my IP address, the app's running on it, and so on. Uh, but in a Bosch-controlled environment, uh, we don't really have that luxury, right? It's a very dynamic environment. And that kind of, the challenges with that flowed through to this, this also the security component as well, this custom security controls on Windows. So rather than having a fairly static VM, with the security controls on it that's known, it's here, it run these, runs these apps, and it can check in frequently for run it, scans, and report. What we had to do is instead, uh, very simply, create a, uh, an API client to say, uh, instead of having the security server reach out to me and connect to me, I'm gonna reach out to it. And that was actually a very simple thing to do in PowerShell. Uh, simple enough where I'm not a PowerShell developer and I was able to whip it out in, in nothing flat. Uh, very straightforward, actually, and, and we just did that as a, as a Bosch add-on. Simple PowerShell to make an API call with its uh, a REST call with its uh, IP address and a few other things, and then exit zero at the end of the PowerShell, and it works like a champ. And then as part of that, we also, in PowerShell, command super cool commandlet to create uh, <laughs> scheduled tasks. Um, so then we, we have it do its one thing one time and then schedule a, a security run every day uh, to, to initiate that API call, that REST call. So it was a, a surprisingly uh, nice and easy experience for a Unix guy to do this on Windows. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Really, I, I think the, the key lesson for me out of that, or thing I learned, was that, um, that doing all this stuff through PowerShell is actually super easy and the .NET frameworks are fantastic. Um, and really, uh, creating a Windows Bosch add-on versus a Linux Bosch add-on, there's really not a whole lot of difference. It's just, it's just the script language, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, and so this we touched on earlier. This is, again, that Boeing-specific uh, security controls. Uh, we just ported it from, from Unix 
uh, to Linux, which is super easy. Uh, you know, uh, the, the thing that was interesting though, we, uh, we took some extra, uh, we took extra care with things in VAR VCAP. We remount some file systems and uh, with different per permissions and so on to address some unique Boeing concerns. Uh, and of course, anytime you're mucking around in, in VAR VCAP, you end up breaking things if you're changing it at the OS level. So we went through several iterations of, of trying to figure out why things broke. Uh, you know, in particular, there is a, uh, a, an SUID executable under VAR VCAP that has to run. It's console. Uh, it provides the service discovery. And it turns out if you remount VAR VCAP without SUID, say don't allow any SUID or root uh, executables uh, under that path, you break service resolution, uh, name resolution, and you break the whole platform. So uh, that one was surprisingly fairly easy to find, though. Some fun troubleshooting. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This is, we already talked about this. This is yeah. that super easy PowerShell script. Yeah. It makes a rest call and also schedules a task. Again, it was just a matter of learning PowerShell versus Bash or something like that. Piece of cake. Yep, this is all stuff. That yeah. I, did I go backwards? You did, I think. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. But we need to reiterate that. <laughs> Host based firewalls. Yeah. And so this one, this is again, we talked about the host based firewalls, which is actually, even if you have, even if your network is, is unrouted or are using a software defined network, I, th I think this is still a good idea. I'd love to see this in the stem cells. Um, you know, just for a uh, defense in depth strategy. And okay, so you have a firewall at the, at the edge of the network. Maybe you got some VM based stuff at the IaaS. Maybe even in the OS itself, maybe it should even uh, try to protect itself, defense in depth. I think it's not a bad idea uh, in general. Uh, and then it also allowed us to do some custom, uh, like this custom access control list entry for the, uh, for the jump box. One of the problems that we had, uh, or challenges we had, is that Boeing wants multi-factor authentication. Uh, however, multi-factor authentication into Ops Manager, uh, Pivotal's GUI on top of Bosch, uh, it doesn't now? exist, or did not at the time. I don't think it does even still. Uh, so the way we addressed that was we said, okay, well, then we just not, don't let anybody into Ops Manager directly, right? So uh, we had tied it into to their enterprise authentication system, but then that meant anybody uh, from anywhere could log into that thing, mm. uh, to Ops Manager. So how we addressed that was we went back to uh, an enterprise-supported image, Windows, with all of its security controls and domain-joined goodness and all that, and we said, okay, that's going to be our entry point from an administrative perspective into the platform, right? So we can get to there, assuming you're an, you're an admin, and then, uh, and then only from that host can we then go to Ops Manager via SSH or via web. And so that kind of uh, really locked it down to address that concern. But then a uh, key piece of that too was to be sure to allow it not only from that data center's Windows jump box, but from the others. Because what happens if that Windows jump box goes down for patching or whatever reason? Boss, you need kind of a fallback plan. You want to be able to get in from somewhere else. Right? Yeah. And that's basically what you just talked about on that one. And this is the same thing. The, the interesting thing here, right, you were pointing this out earlier, yeah. is the Git repository. So we, we for those IP tables rules, or for the host-based firewall rules, we store those in Git. So as an administrator, rather than having to modify a Bosch release, uh, which can be challenging, it's not for the faint of heart, we stored those rules in Git, and when the system comes up, it pulls them. It has a set of base rules, kind of basic stuff, but any customizations you can pull in from Git dynamically. Um, and then you have a, a nice uh, you know, history of yeah. who changed what, and. That's so always on. nice. Yeah. Catch Andrew changing stuff on us. <laughs> <laughs> mm, all right. So, do you have anything to add there? there? No. No? All right. Not unless you do. Anybody? Go ahead, all right. Speak yep. And here's our pipelines. Um, we use runtime config on these. And actually, Andrew is doing Charlotte right now. He's our automator. And when we get to the questions and answers, you might want to ask him a few yeah. questions. So, so this addresses how do we actually 
get the, these bits on the servers, right? And so it's via Bosch release and via what's called a runtime config. Obviously, I don't know if any, everybody's familiar with that. But a runtime config right? simply defines the Bosch releases uh, that you wish to go on all of your VMs. Instead of having to say, okay, for Diego cells, put these Bosch releases. For Go routers, put these Bosch releases. If you have a common Bosch release that you want to go everywhere, you put it in this runtime config. It just centralizes that, that configuration. Uh, and so, but then of course you have to push that runtime config out, you have to deploy it. You, you push that out to your Bosch uh, director. Uh, and so we maintain those, or Boeing maintains those, those runtime configs in Git, and pushes them out uh, with a concourse pipeline. It's, uh, I think it's that straightforward. Concourse yeah. is our friend. Yeah. Oh, look at here. And that's it. Any questions? So this started out with all four of those people in there. Can you see it? <laughs> I maybe need to make it bigger. <laughs> yeah. That's correct. Yep. There were some unique security requirements uh, within Boeing. Um, if I can't say much more than that, but uh, uh, they, they yeah. yes, basically yes. We just wanted to limit all ingress traffic so that only the VMs within Cloud Foundry could talk to those talk to themselves. Typically, you know, you'd rely on a, you'd create an isolated network, a completely unrouted network, uh, maybe through NSX or through true firewalling or just disconnected completely. Uh, you know, at the VMware level. Uh, we did, didn't have that luxury, so we created our own solution, which I think actually, because of de defense in depth, I think it actually could be used elsewhere. Yeah, go, for, go ahead. Uh, like in terms of like the compliance, what was the main like, factor? Is this just knowing what VMs were Can you repeat that question, the, please? So with the, um, we have an SCR and ACP that we have to be compliant with. Internal, so, document, internal, yeah, internal. documentation, yeah. Yeah. And Standards. Yeah, which is, is a lot to, yeah. Well, well, I would say the SCR hundreds of pages of through, internal yes. compliance stuff driven by government and, and other right. needs, right? Um, so there was a lot of upfront diagramming and, and pulling all the parts and trying to understand the traffic flows. Uh, the security team in particular wanted to know every traffic flow between every component. Um, and it quickly became apparent that we needed to really lock this thing down. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of hours of work yeah. trying to yeah, get through it. <laughs> <laughs> how do you package all these kind of Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, but to make a lot, some of the teams happy, we had to deal with, okay, the dynamic nature of this thing, where it's used to spinning up the server, putting all this time into it, and the care and feeding of it, and now it's completely dynamic, it's going to come up on a different IP address with some random host, seemingly random host name, you know, and, and so we had to do things like, okay, negotiate, well, we'll, we'll make, instead of you contacting us, the server will reach out to you, we'll issue an API call to you, tell you, here I am, you know, uh, and I belong to the PCF project, or whatever. Yeah, there's quite a bit of that kind of stuff. And then also, uh, we also had to do some integration with the, the team that, that inventories the VMs from the, the VM level. Sis. So we started, we queried uh, vSphere, in this case the vSphere API, to get a list of the VMs periodically and send that off to the, uh, to the system. Which doesn't always get um, updated correctly. 
because that's, you know, and that's one of those things that you're ongoing fixing. So this is telling us that we have servers, VMs that were there last week. Today they're already gone. Yeah, but we're and, non compliant. And since since so you repave so every week, right? right. And at one time the purging wasn't happening properly, and it said like you had thousands and thousands and thousands of VMs <laughs> yeah. or something like that. That was yeah. awful. <laughs> December. So it was last year. So a year ago today, oh, okay. we had this system yeah. set up where we were repaving every week. And every, every, uh, uh, every VM was um, entered into an ecosystem where they would record what the VM's purpose was and all of its compliance issues and all these things. And it's, it's a traditional system we've had for around, around for a while. And we were always worried, is it going to be able to keep up with us? And then our VMware guys check some box. I forgot what one it is, but they checked some box and it started to balance the VMs from one host to another while Cloud Foundry was trying to balance hosts from one to another. And so we ended up, we, I got an email that said uh, that we had like 10,000 repaves because I was getting an email saying, hey, cool, we got 200 repaves because there's 200 VMs. And it says, you have 10,000 of them. It's like, <laughs> what? And, 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 and that was repaved. That means that also 10,000 recreates, you know, I mean, delete and recreates. And that means that was 20,000 entries and exits out of that ecosystem. And it worked. And they didn't even know it. They were like, Bosch oh. Yeah. 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 Bosch was fighting the other uh, ecosystem, the other the VM system. So. It worked, but we were running out of space, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were being hogs. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Anyway. <laughs> Multiple. How many levels are there in a tiramisu? <laughs> We're at the spongy level. <laughs> so, no. No, it, 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 oh, Sean. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. This is about Cisco ACI, okay. the application-centric uh, infrastructure, you know, right, um, from uh, regular uh, NSX switch mode to ACI mode, where you can actually, you know, when you build the network, you can build the network, uh, you can segregate the network mm -hmm. based on, you know, applications. Um, so how can we integrate that kind of network architecture into this, um, this architecture? This uh, you know, I'm not quite sure. I haven't used that. Maybe, Sean, do you have any, any thoughts there? Or we could sync up. We can maybe get you connected with somebody who might know. You have any thoughts, Sean? And we already have that at the application level with micro segmentation within Cloud Foundry, right? So, but the next level would be to do it at the service level as well.
contraband. Don't show anybody. <laughs> Great question. I've heard of some customers who are using Cisco ACI. That's not contraband. Uh, just something, I think there are some conflicts there which you need to be careful of, which causes some problems in, on the cloud foundry side of it. Um, I, can, I can find the threads. I do remember some conflicts between a Cisco ACI and cloud foundry. It can, I think there are some great things that you need to check, right? But. Do we have any more questions? I will finish passing out some contraband stickers. Thank you, Sean. <laughs>